Good evening. We are so grateful that you've come out to join us tonight. For all those that have made preparation for us to, to enter the Lord's house tonight to be together, thank you. For the choir seated behind, we're grateful to have them with us tonight. Look forward to our time of worship in a wonderful way. Will you join me in your order of service for our call to worship this evening? It is the Lord that calls us into his house to come and to sing praises. Join me. God is light in whom there is no darkness. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And we love darkness rather than light. Our opening hymn is found in your hymnal. Uh, there won't be screens this evening operating, so find a hymnal in front of you. Join me at number 298, hymn number 298. Will you stand with me as we sing? Please remain, remain standing as we turn to God's holy word. The scripture is Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering, acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. 
crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. It's great to see you on this Good Friday. And as we contemplate the words of Christ on the cross, it's amazing to consider that this cruel instrument of death would be used by God to become the very means of our salvation. It's incredible that a cross is central to our Christian faith in almost any church you would enter across all denominational lines, the symbol of the cross as is here in our church. Paul said, it is foolishness to the Jews, it's a stumbling block to Gentiles, but for those who believe, it is the power of God to salvation. Many years ago, I was reflecting over this great hymn that we just sang, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And as I thought about the words that I was singing and that we just sung, I thought about literally surveying the cross. So tonight, as part of this homily and meditation before we hear the seven words in the choir tonight, a meditation in surveying the cross. Paul wrote in Ephesians in the great prayer, and he said, I want you to know how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of God. And in that prayer, it's an outline of the cross. The greatest demonstration of God's love for us and the giving of His Son, Jesus, and the sacrifice that Christ made for all of us and for our world. So let's survey the cross tonight. You see the cross right to my right, to your left. I thought about the beam of the cross going out toward the east. That beam represents the past, everything in our past. The cross is a timeless event. It predates Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. He was the Word who was with God and was God. He preceded Adam and Eve and the creation. Revelation tells us that Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The cruciform love of God existed before time to redeem us who live in time. It is relevant not only to world history, but to our own personal history, to our past. Herein we say that our past sins and our shortcomings are embraced. And the words of the great hymn by Wesley, my sins not in part but the whole are nailed to the cross and I bear them no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus said that He came into the world to save sinners. For the woman taken in adultery, to Peter, one of his own who denied Him, that He reclaimed. To Saul of Tarsus, who persecuted the church, who would later become its greatest apostle and missionary all the way down to church history to where we are today. We can say in our own lives that old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All my yesterdays, all my sins, all my shortcomings are covered through the blood of the Lamb. Jesus Christ, who was slain on the cross for us, scatters our sins as far as the east is from the west throws them into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered anymore. And as Corey Ten Boom says, and he places a no fishing sign up by that as well. That means that we do not have to live in fear or regret or guilt. And that possibility is open for all of us. Forgiveness is open to all. As John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sins of the world, that being goes way before time and encompasses all our yesterdays. If we think about the other beam going west, that beam would represent the future. We have so much that may concern us in the future. The external view of the future, large-scale dangers that we face that threaten our very existence. Terrorism, global war, nuclear destruction, disease, overpopulation, all these things converge as we think about our future. And even from an internal view, concerns about our own health, financial stability, our children's future and well-being. So many things that we are concerned about related to the future. But I think it is incredible to imagine and know that 2,000 years ago, Christ could look right into this very sanctuary and see every one of us. He knows the future because He's already there. <laughs> he is the eternal God who dwells above time, past, present, and future. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He died and He is alive forevermore. So whatever may be held in my future, my eternal destiny is secured once and for all because of the Christ, because of the cross of Jesus. Whatever temptation I face and you face, whatever trial we encounter, wherever we may fail in the future, it is covered by the sacrifice of Christ. We repent and confess He is faithful and just to forgive. This is truly Good Friday, but it's only Good Friday because of Easter Sunday. These two must be held together. Our future is secure. We have hope now and into the unbounded future because Christ died and was raised from the dead to give us eternal hope. That beam of the cross reaches into the future and even into eternity. If you look at the vertical beam of the cross, it goes downward. One of our, our creeds indicates that Jesus descended to the dead. Jesus gave death to death. He conquered death. He led captivity captive. He brought about life eternal and abundant. And that's why he could say at the tomb of Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead, even though a person should die, yet they will live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. We say that as a part of our funeral ritual. It's not just words on a page. But it is the very core of what we believe because He died and rose again. I would also add here that I think as we think of this vertical beam going down, that it reaches into the deepest hurts and wounds of our lives and the darkest periods of our lives. Isaiah says He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and by His stripes we are healed. Ultimately, all healing comes from God. Yet, mysteriously and wonderfully, it is through the sacrifice of Christ that brings about forgiveness and healing for our hurts and our losses. Wherein Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The down beam of the cross reaches into the deepest wounds and hurts of our lives, bringing ultimate healing. And last, but certainly not the least part, is the beam that goes upward. Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth, he literally bridged heaven and earth for all of us here. 
the upward beam reaches to heaven itself. Revelation 5, 6 says, Then I saw a lamb as if it had been slain, standing in the midst of the throne. Jesus, the conqueror of death in heaven. And the upward beam of the cross pointing toward heaven where Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. In the words of the Apostle Paul, he says, Whatever was gained to me, I counted loss because of Christ. The excellency of knowing Christ and being found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, but one that comes through faith in Christ. And Paul would later write and say, God forbid that I should boast in anything except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The cross reaches into heaven and symbolizes our way there through Christ, through the blood of the Lamb, slain, but yet standing in the midst of the throne. I hope we all might spend some time in reflection and deeper thoughts on surveying the cross. And tonight as we hear these seven last words, that our hearts may be moved as we continue to survey the cross and count everything lost, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We give God thanks this evening for the word of God and the meditative words that we are to reflect on on this Good Friday. At this time, I invite us as a family of God's children to bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Most gracious and loving King of Kings, Lord of Lords, we come this evening to remember you. We come to give you our thanks our praise and our prayers as we stand faithfully and boldly as your children. As our hearts kneel at the cross of your suffering on this evening, we are reminded of your mercy for us. As our hearts kneel at the cross of your persecution, we are reminded of the hope that you have given us and continue to instill in us. As our hearts kneel at the cross of your broken and bruised body, we are reminded that you have the victory over death. As our hearts kneel at the cross of your unfair judgment by man, we are reminded of the freedom we have in your love and the grace and mercy that you provide for us each and every day. On this Good Friday of solemnness and pain, let us remember that surely the presence of the Lord is in us and with us. And may we feel your presence of comfort as we lay our prayers at the foot of your cross, as we lift you up in our lives on this day and every day, Lord. We come with thanksgiving and praise to say thank you for being almighty, for being faithful, for being just, and for taking on the burden of our sins so that we could be free to be in your love as your children. In Christ's name we pray with continued thanksgiving and mercy. Let us all say amen. The year was 1867 when Theodore Dubois first performed his seven last words of Christ on the cross in the church that he served in Paris. The work grew in popularity throughout the 20th century, all across our country as well. And today is the most performed Good Friday work around the world. 
There are churches around the large cities around our country that perform this every Good Friday. We hope tonight that it will be certainly meaningful for us. We're delighted, too, to be joined by the choir of Spanish Fort Presbyterian, our neighbors. So glad they're with us. Their director is Barbara Hudson, and she has been so wonderful to uh, come and to sing and even to share her voice with us tonight as well. Worship with us as we continue tonight with the seven last words of Christ.
Jesus and the two
Temple's veil was rent, and the 